Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for the webinar this evening. My name is Chloe McKee and I work in the Beef and Lamb team at HTB. Tonight we'll be discussing the recommended grass and clover list, where the data comes from and how to get the most out of it when making reseeding decisions on your farm. The plan of action is that I'll run through the housekeeping, introduce our speakers and then we'll kick off with a poll, followed by short presentations from our panel before going into the Q&A discussion. As usual, you will all be muted throughout the webinar. So if you'd like to ask a question, then please type it into the question box on the right hand side of your screen. If you can't see the questions box, please click on the orange, orange arrow to open up the control panel. Click on the questions drop down and you'll see where you can type your question in. If you're joining us through a mobile or tablet, your questions box will be at the bottom of the screen with a question mark icon. You can type your questions in at any time throughout the webinar and please use the, this box to let us know if you're having any technical difficulties and my colleagues here and in the background will do our best to help. The usual advice is to log out and come back in. We have three speakers on our panel this evening. Ellie Sweetman is NIAB's Forage Crop Specialist, overseeing national statutory and commercial forage trials programmes and wider project work of which one is the RGCL. Her background is in livestock mixed farming and industry, business and technical analysis, agri-environment, resource management and agricultural education, management and governance. We also have Chris Duller, an independent consultant specialising in delivering soil and grassland management advice across all of the livestock sectors. He has a thorough knowledge of soils, nutrient management and managing grazing systems and forage crops. And finally, Nick Morris. Nick is an ex-dairy farmer, now farming beef and arable in Cheshire with 83 hectares of land. And Nick uses a cut and carry system on the beef cattle from March to November. So to kick us off, we'll start with our poll for this evening. And we'd like to know if you currently use the recommended grass and clover list to inform your variety and mixture choices for reseeding, please. So hopefully that should be on your screen now. And the options are yes, I check that the seed I sow is of recommended grass and clover list varieties. Yes, my advisor checks that the seed I sow is on the list. Or your merchant checks that the seed you sow is on the list. Yes, a combination of the answers above. Or no, you don't use the recommended grass and clover list to influence your reseeding choices. Thanks everyone, I can see the votes coming in now. I'll just give you a couple more seconds. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, everyone. So 50% of our audience tonight check that the seed they sow is on the recommended grass and clover list variety list, followed by a combination of the three answers and jointly in place with um, the don't use the recommended grass and clover list at 17%. And then at 8%, they use an advisor or merchant checks the seed. So that's great that majority of you tonight are using the list and find that useful. Thanks, everyone, for putting your answers in. And we'll go back to the presentation. Thanks, Luan. I think we're ready to hand over to Ellie. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Chloe. Hello, everybody. Um, nice to be with you this evening. So I look after the recommended grass and clover list trials program, and we have. Uh, various sites and meetings all throughout the year. So uh, if I start by showing you a, a clip of um, some of our plots at Headley. Thank you, Sian, if you can move on, please. Is there a handle to wind? Do I have control? No. Nope. Apologies, everyone. I think that we might be having some connection problems. Yeah, okay, lovely. Okay, thank you very much. So we have trial sites uh, across a large part of the UK in the major grass growing areas. So we have both North and East Scotland, as well as Northern Ireland, um, that are predominantly used for the national listing. 
but that information does carry through to the recommended listing trials work as well um, as the varieties get further down the, the system. Uh, then the main site for the MAB is in North Yorkshire, then there's the IBIS site in Wales, and then in Gloucestershire there's either DLF or DSV have a site. So uh, various different trial operators that contribute um, and there's then some best practice working between those through the BSPB uh, trial operators meetings. Um, so we've got lots of lots of good brains involved. And then disease trials run in both Devon and Worcestershire, uh, where um, the disease isn't isn't necessarily encouraged, but it's in in good opportunities for disease to take hold uh, and they get a real test of, of varieties and their resistance levels. Thank you. So the assessments that happen throughout the uh, lifespan of these varieties in trials includes two systems. One is through simulated grazing management and one is through conservation management. In order to be efficient, these are both used within the three year cycle of one variety's um, three harvest years after it's been sown. We're also measuring digestibility value, of course, devaluing and quality, very important. Um, so ME and for clover is crew protein as well. Brown matter yield is predominantly the information that most folks tend to be interested in, but as well as that we have seasonal growth. So that's from early spring right through to autumn and also for some of the species it's monthly cuts. Uh, ground cover uh, on a number of occasions just to see how that variety is pro progressing through its three years of harvest. It, it's no good to get all the bulk in the first year and then it to peter out um, later on. Winter hardiness assessments are taken uh, first thing in the early spring just to see how the varieties are coping with the conditions. And then of course disease resistance is at all the trial sites but as well specifically at the two disease sites. Um, the trials are then managed according to good farming practice on the whole. So the fertilizers are follow best local practice in particular. So within the RB209 sort of guidelines as well. Um, I am the project coordinator. So if there's anything that somebody wants to use, say a particular herbicide or, or a particular adjustment to nutrient, management they will come to me initially if it's something within my remit to answer I can do so make that decision or if it's beyond that then it goes to the project board or the crop committees in order to, for them to get an overall decision because of course this can impact the whole program and the data and the, the fairness of the treatment of the varieties across the board for all the breeders. The project board is made up of a group of different people coming from different um, perspectives so it gives ensures a good fair assessment of the diseases when the data comes together um, and is reviewed annually and the decisions are made. Um, so we also have the Animal and Plant Health Agency do some in inspections of sites uh, and oversee the national listing side of the program which I'll uh, go on to explain a bit more about. Thank you. So the timeline, now the decisions committee for the, national, the recommended list, sorry, to be produced um, as much as this year, they are made of a committee of farmers, breeders and independents. So that can be uh, advisors and other people from industry. To start with, the candidate varieties that are very new, they've been developed by breeders, but they haven't been released into the big wide world, they need to come through first for national listing. And they have to be on the national list in order to be sold in the UK. It used to be as an alternative, they could be on another European country's national list, grouped under the banner of um, common catalogue. But now they're out of the EU, that no longer applies. So all the varieties have to come and be judged under UK growing conditions and assessed by the National List uh, Species Committee to see that they are able uh, to be sold in the UK. They're both distinct, uniform and stable varieties and they also have value for cultivation and use. So that has to happen behind the scenes before the recommended list work happens. But the data that's used to generate that National List um, data for decisions 
that data is also carried forward into the recommended list data and those varieties and plots are grown within the same trials as a recommended list. So the plots you can see before you, on the left you have the early varieties and um, they are both recommended list and national listing varieties all mingled in together, grow under the same conditions. So, oh, sorry, back a sec, Suman, sorry, please. Thank you. So I doubled on a little bit there. Um, so we have all the site, or six sites that are used for the national listing, but then that information um, continues on to the other sites that are for recommended listing as well. And we have those a few sites that are just recommended listing, don't include all the national listing sewing. So um, then once we've got all the data from the national list, they go forward as a candidate and they go forward for a decision making as to whether they're good enough to go on the national list. And they have to bring an overall improvement compared to the average of the list in order to come on in the first place. So after at least 12 years or so of breeding and development, six years worth of data under national listing, they still have to prove that they're well above the, the mean in order to be allowed on the list at all. So a lot of work has to happen before they get that far. Thank you, Sue -Anne. And then to stay on the recommended list, they get five years after they've been first given that provisional status. So PG, provisional general, and PS, provisional, um, I mustn't say special, it's not special, it's specific. So if they're, they may be a weaker in an area, but they're really strong in a major area. So therefore they're given a, an S status. After five years of that data, then uh, they get reviewed uh, in a decision making again. And in that meeting, they have to be better than the mean again or equal to it will do at that point um, in order to get a whole G or S rating and not be provisional anymore. And then once they've gone that G or S, reconsidered every four years, um, and so by this stage, they've had uh, two sewings under national list. They've got another two sewings plus under recommended list. So you, you're building up the data each year on year and getting more and more reliable data uh, in large matrix over that period. Thank you. Was that me or is that somebody else? I can talk about that. Was that, was that my last one? Yes, it is. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was a really useful insight into how the list has been developed. Uh, Chris, I'll move on to you to run through how we can get the most out of the list, please. Grant, evening, everybody. Um, yeah, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a Greston consultant based out in West Wales, and I've spent the last 20 years nagging at people. Um, and I guess tonight, yeah, I've, I've got to start nagging at those 17% of you said you didn't use the list. Um, I'm a bit nerdy with numbers, and I, I love it when the list comes out because um, it's just tables of, of data. But the, the beautiful thing about the list is it is genuine independent data. And in a farming industry, we don't get a lot of independent data. There's normally somebody's got a slant or an edge to take, um, whereas the recommended list is, is genuine um, you know, undoctored numbers that can be really, really useful. Um, I say I'm a part-time farmer, grass consultant. Um, my wife was a grass breeder for 20 years. So you can imagine, yeah, the long winter evenings used to fly by with conversations about grass. Okay, next slide, to so, um, Just before I start, I, I thought we'd just look at the value of reseeding as against the cost of reseeding. Do your own cost, but it's somewhere around about £250 an acre to, to do a full conventional reseed. We need to get it right. Um, but my seed cost is less than 25% of that total cost. I would say straight away, don't get hung up on trying to save money when it comes to buying seed um, by taking cheaper seed mixtures with maybe varieties that aren't on the list anymore. They might, as um, as Ellie said, might be on a, a French list or a German list. You know, we need to know that they're decent, they've been tested and they perform in UK conditions. Um, with that value of £250 an acre, a decent reseed done properly, I can recover all that cost in its first 12 months. Okay, next one, please. 
so tonight we're going to get all into varieties um all i'll say is at the end of the day it doesn't matter what varieties we've got um i can muck it up with a poor seabed preparation and how i manage early establishment um and the early management phase so it is part of the process um the right type of mixture is just as important as variety choice so variety choice is very much yeah putting the icing on the cake and the fine tuning okay thanks sir okay busy slide lots on it basically when we start thinking about reseeding we just want to be sure we know what we want to achieve um, the more information you can go with to your seed merchant will help you develop a lay that suits your system. So you want to be just clear in your mind about what you want the lay to do, how long you want it to last, um, recognize any constraints from soil type location, and then think really hard about what category of grasses you want, how much perennials, whether they're early, intermediate, or late, the balance between the tetraploid and the diploid varieties, um, which behave in, in different manners. Um, Think carefully about the heading date range. And then there's all the options about the other things to, to maybe chuck in the mix as well, just to complicate matters. So your, your clover choices, um, alternative grasses, and then more recently, we've seen a big rise in multi-species mixtures. And then it's really, really important to get the balance of grasses to go with your chicory and your plantain absolutely spot on. Okay, next one. So once I've got what we decide what we want to do with the lay, um, then we need to think about getting out the list and finding the varieties that would most suit our system. And I can either use the list to go through and pick out the grasses I want and then try and find the seed mixture with those that are included, or I can find a, a mixture that's an off the shelf mix and then literally just use the, the list to go through and make sure that all the varieties I'm buying are there and are going to perform the job I want to do. Um, quite often when we go and buy mixtures, um, you might not be able to get the grasses you want and sometimes they'll say well i haven't got this one i can give you a replacement the list gives me an opportunity just to make sure those replacements are up to scratch and are a good replacement okay next one so this is just a, a snapshot of one of the pages in the, in the farmer handbook um, for um, one of the categories of ryegrass and all i've done there is just whiz down everything's measured in terms of percentage increase above the average um, my control and you know one or two percent either way doesn't make a lot of odds but when we start to get grasses that might be five six seven percent higher in certain traits um, I get my big part highlighter pen out and I start crossing these off and saying oh yeah those are the ones that I'm going to be looking for when I come to do my shopping for a seed mix now even with Abergain as very good energy and yield figures there are other varieties on that list that might have better qualities in other things such as as ground cover and I'd be interested to know from the audience about what you look for when you're scanning down the list. Um, some people, it's all about energy and quality. For me, I'm certainly interested in ground cover, and, and which gives us a measure of persistence. Okay, next one. So yeah, here's me and my marker pen, and I'm just going through and pulling out the varieties that stand out as the good yielders, the high quality ones, um, the ones with good ground cover, this is a, a grab from the um, the merchants list, which contains a whole wealth of information. Both of the lists, um, the formats are available on the website and you can download them all straight from the HDB website. The merchants list is the real nerdy one for people like me who love their numbers. Um, and it breaks down all the um, categories into things like seasonality growth. So I've just highlighted there at the bottom a couple of grasses that have got really strong early season growth. So if you're an early turnout farm, they're, they're really worth having. Quite often you might pay a penalty for later growth in the season, but for most people it's that spring grass could be a real bonus. If you're on a wet farm and you haven't got an early turnout, then they probably wouldn't be the grasses for you, and you might be able to select others that got a slightly later growth profile. Okay, next one through. As always, there's a red pen to go in my green pen, and the red pen is literally just pulling out the, those grasses that might have some slight issues that might not suit my farm. Um, if you're up north, maybe disease might not be much of an issue. If you're down in Cornwall and the southwest, then crown rust and dresser resistance might be more of a um, of interest to you. Again, it's not saying don't use the varieties, but you might only want to put them in at a kilo or two in a mix rather than maybe four or five. Okay, next one. So that whole business of yeah, seed mixture balance and variety choice is part of it. 
and those are all my issues about successful receding what I've got to think about. So it doesn't stop by just going buying a bag um, and thinking, right, I've got the best varieties, how can I fail? Again, I'd be interested to know what you guys think is the blueprint for um, the perfect reseed, but there's an awful lot to consider. Okay, next one. So just my horror stories. Nobody ever takes me to see their lovely new um, reseed. I always get dragged out to look at the disasters. So this guy didn't bother the soil test. Um, pH is well below where it should be. Um, phosphates are on the floor now. We find out um, poor consolidation, late going in. And guess what? Yeah, the thistles have arrived big time. Great clover take. Um, he's really reluctant to spray, but in reality, he's now going to have a very gappy open lay. Next one. OK, this guy, it started to rain. They didn't roll these couple of strips um, and you can see the impact it had on plant establishment. So I've got a very gappy sward, poor tillering, lots of meadow grass. And that is literally by him leaving it late and not looking at weather forecast. OK, next one. Yeah, last year's reseed. Um, and OK, proper proper mole infestation. But it is those sort of attention to detail. If we got the mole man in at the early stage, um, we could have at least re reduced some of this damage. Um, and it's going to be a patch up job just to try and, and um, sort this out. OK, last last disaster picture. OK, it's it's not just a Welsh thing. It might be. But they're very keen on putting a quarter of a pound or half a pound of rape in there, autumn reseed. And then I get taken along to look at what's left the following spring. And invariably, it's open and it's gappy and the meadow grass is coming in. And you think, well, really, was it worth it? So we've just got to be careful in that real early phase of establishment that we just give it the tender love and care that a reseed deserves. OK, thank you. So, yeah, this is my blueprint. Do your planning, address your soil issues, sort out your weeds before you start. Talk to your merchants, look at the list, make sure you've got the right type of seed mix, um, and make sure you're using the right method. Um, Nick's going to talk about um, minimum till and drilling and everything else. Sometimes the plough is the best bit of kit. Um, if I can avoid it, I will. And then we've got to think about how we just look after it in those first few months. OK, that'll do. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, we'll move on to Nick now. And Nick gives an insight into your farming system and how you use this to make decisions, please. Uh, good evening. Um, we <coughs> rear uh, beef cattle for a company and we take them through to um, just before finishing. We have them at six months old and we take them through to about 22 months old. We feed zero graze grass from as early as we can to as late as we can, as in as we can travel. Um, main grasses are perennial rye grasses, but we have been trying some uh, hybrids and uh, some festuliums. Uh, when we when we're choosing the, the 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 rye grasses, my first consideration is how much energy is the grass going to give me. Because energy is, is the driving factor, is what grows me cattle, and um, uh, uh, that's 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 paramount for me. Secondly, I will look at how long it's got to last, um, whether it needs to be tetraploid or diploid, depending on what what I want to do with it. Whether I want to, I, I'm cutting mainly every 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 30 days or 20 25 to 30 days. Uh, that that grass is is what we've cut this time it's a second cutting uh we got ahead of us because we couldn't start too early uh, normally we would like to cut it about six six inches that's that's about 12 to 15 inches high and uh, that's an italian and um it's put in in an arable rotation that is so that that was that was put in because um we didn't get all the seed in in 2019 and what we did get in was a disaster so we ended up doing a, a patch job with the iron box in the spring of 2020 and that's the result of it uh we've used um conventional for uh, a long while um trying to use less conventional now for reseeding we're using um uh, direct 
I'm bucking and uh, a, a no-till drill. Uh, we've both used both of them successfully. Um, the the, the no-I'm bucking we've done on a, a grazing field where we tip some suckler cows. We cut it and then we uh, drilled it and let the cows on it all the while until it started showing and then we fastened them off it and that was really successful so um uh yeah that's about it really we, we keep um grazing let's say grazing for as long as we can and uh the grasses that we chose i, I also like to make sure that the winter hardy and, and that the, the grasses are there for you know, a, a long part, a while. So I tend to look at what percentage is still there after the third year um, for persistency. Um, because it's not like as the guy before said, it's not a cheap, cheap, cheap exercise. So it's worth doing well. And um, yeah, yeah, that's about it. Thanks. Thanks very much, Nick. And I'm sure there'll be um, plenty of questions to follow. Before we move on, I'd just like to highlight that those of you that are signed up to receive our Beef and Lamb Ruminant News magazine or the All Things Dairy magazine through the post, you will receive a copy of the recommended Grass and Clover List handbook this summer with the magazine. And in the meantime, the handbooks and Merchant's Guide can be accessed online. Um, so we have a few questions in already. So the first one is, how can we use the recommended grass and clover list to help improve organic matter percentage and soil health, as well as mixed species? Can I come to you first, Chris, please? Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> OK, so it's not something we're going to be measuring. All we measure in, in terms of um, grass assessments are the above ground traits. But you have to remember that invariably your below ground root activity matches what we grow above ground. So there's a direct relationship with yield. When we come into looking at um, mixed swords, so we know there's complementary root growth, so they go at different layers in the soil profile. So if I'm mixing my ryegrass and my timothies and my festuoliums, then I'm going to increase that rooting profile. And whilst we're chasing organic matter, why wouldn't you have the likes of, of red clover with a big taproot as well? So I think it's, it's those are the ways that, you know, basically we're looking for the high yields <coughs> and, the, and the, the range of rooting depths would be my take on that. Thanks, Chris. Ali or Nick, do you have anything to add? Um, the, there's, if you're doing a arable rotation, it, there's certainly got to be room for um, putting green mulch in and um, putting the spring reese, either spring reseed or a spring sown barley crop in. Um, that, that we're looking at that this time. Thanks, Nick. The next question, Ali, is for you. Um, can I use the list to work out the megajoules per kilo of DM of a seed mixture to compare one mixture to another? I think you're on mute, Ali. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes, my MEU is on there, so it, it has as a fashion. Um, but of course, how that plant grows and behaves in your own circumstances depends on how you manage it. Um, so you're better off to look at um, the resultant sward rather than relying on what you can calculate from the, the book data. Thanks, Ellie. And the next one's for you, Nick. How do you measure the success of the seeds that you have chosen from the list? Uh, well, with, with zero graze, so it, it's it's quite easy to see how how, how much crops we're getting off the field. And I know that I, I've only got a small eight-ton trailer with wide tyres, so we can go travel. So I know I can get when it acts full to busting, we can get about four ton of fresh weight on that of about twenty percent dry matter. Um, so that's that's one way, and and. A persistency, yeah. I mean, if it starts getting gappy or you know, 
um, then we then we start to look in, into uh, boosting it. Um, we, we will boost now rather than rather than go for a, a complete overhaul, especially if we've got no weed grasses or there's, there's no uh, major weed infestation. Thanks, Nick. And what do you find is the best way of boosting that lay after a few years if you feel it needs a top up? Um, I, I, I will go in for, um, depending on whether whether the, whether I, I want, I will look in for the seasonality um, uh, grasses, uh, the, 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 the amount of grass that we, they provide uh, during the season. Uh, and if I need, if I think this field will, will carry me at the shoulders of the season, then I will look for early spring growth and um, uh, uh, varieties that will give me early spring growth combined with other varieties, probably later grasses, that will uh, boost the yield during the back end. Um, and possibly uh, a festulium as well, because they will grow at lower soil temperatures. Thanks, Nick. That's really useful. Um, Ellie, the next one is for you. Have you done any research on herbs, please? Uh, hello. Not, not as part of the recommended grass and clover list system. Um, we have got some other foraging project work going on underway at NIAB at the moment. So if anybody wants to drop me an email, I can make sure they're, they're included and we get their involvement in that project. Thanks, Ellie. Um, Chris, I'll start with you for this one. Are the drought-resistant properties of Festilolium grass varieties worth prioritising for farm in the east with reduced rainfall rather than a late PRG? Um, there's no doubt that some of them have a good drought tolerance. Um, as, again, as part of all the um, uh, monitoring programme and, and variety trial sites, we've got several that are under severe drought restrictions. So you head up to Headley Hall in most years, um, and they're under some sort of drought stress. So they've been tested and yeah, we know that we can get some some boosts. Um, the tetraploids generally tend to have a little bit more drought tolerance, um, but yeah, certainly I personally, I would rather go for a festulolium above a, a something like Coxfoot. I think they're slightly easier to manage, but other people have a, would probably have opinions on that. Um, but yeah, they're, I say it's not something we're measuring at the minute and it's quite a difficult one when we start looking at some um, how, how we actually measure roots is hard enough work measuring leaf, let alone trying to get measure roots. Thank you. And um, if you were looking to include a white clover in the lay going forward, how can you use the list to make sure you pick the best, best variety? Well, there are white clover varieties are included in the grass and clover list. And the white clovers are all grown on the trials programme with a companion grass as well to be um, more representative. Yeah, so it's all about picking the right leaf size. So if you look through the list, they're, they're across the table, we have increasing leaf size. The larger the leaf, generally the less tolerant they are of hard grazing. So we need to think not just about what you're grazing most of the year but certainly for some of the dairy boys we've got to think about well if you've got sheep coming in over winter maybe the real big stuff might not survive um, and ditto if you're doing long silage cuts um, or running heavy covers then the, the smaller leaf might not be a, the best way so you need to pick whatever leaf size suits your system in the merchants, sorry in the merchant's guide and a bit more data on the clovers um, it includes how the clover behaves under hard and light defoliation. Uh, so you can see which varieties are standing up best to more sheep-like grazing or more cattle-like grazing. Um, but yes, there is quite a considerable range in leaf size and the leaf size measurement is uh, included in there as well. So they go from, I think, the smallest one uh, around, um, is it four or six hundred millimetres squared over a leaf up until about fifteen hundred. So there is a real, real variation. I mean, most merchants will sell you a blend that includes a bit of a spread of leaf size just to cover your bases a little bit. Yeah. OK, well, thanks both. Thank you for explaining that one. Ellie, the next one is for you. In your trials, do you look at all the varieties in the world or is it restricted to particular seed houses? 
it's not restricted, but the breeders have to submit their varieties into the trial system uh, and they pay for the varieties that come in for it. So uh, they all have to be on the national list and it's in the interest of the breeders to put their varieties in a good chance of getting above the mean if they can on that list because obviously it will be a more saleable variety for them. So there are a range of different breeders. Uh, some have quite a lot in, some uh, are smaller breeders maybe only have a few, um, some who have most of their sales in other European countries um, sort of will still keep a handle here and others have a bigger market. So it is quite quite variable, but there are a good range of different breeders um, and they have the opportunity to be, to be involved in overseeing the programme. Thanks, Ellie. And what difference does it make silaging a brand new lay versus an old lay or one that has been on the list for several years? Is there a, a large notable difference in yield? Yes, there generally would be. Um, there's been progress year on year in the years produced for the varieties on the list. And bearing in mind, that's at the same nutrient input year on year. So you're getting not only more yield, higher yield than varieties, but they're also doing so um, with the same or less inputs. So uh, they are, it is important to try and use the list of varieties. They're going to be more efficient. Um, Financially, yes, reseeding is, is a big cost, but it is worth the investment if it means you're going to get better return on your investment and higher yielding, potentially better quality. Yeah, I can, I can, I can agree with that. We, last year, we, we, we've got two fields that we regularly silage, and uh, I thought that they were, they've been in 15 years, mainly, mainly cut, and uh, they were all. Uh, 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 leading grasses at the time. Um, they're both yielding or appear to be yielding okay. Um, but I thought well, about time we give them a boost. So we, we uh, uh, ironboxed uh, one field in after third cut last year and uh, rolled it in and we've just cut it. And certainly from a visual point of view, the field was a, a lot more even. Uh, there was uh, there was more the, the, the swaths were larger um, than the, the other field, so we will do the, the other field again this year. One thing that's also important to bear in mind is um, that when you've got a well-developed established soil that's got a really good root system, it's going to be able to make much more use of the resources that are there in the soil and cycling through the soil than something that is newly sown. Um, so it is really important how you manage that, how you cut it and when, how much time you give it to regenerate for the root um, and stem reserves to refill, um, stem new leaves out, capture that sunlight energy again before you go on too early uh, for grazing. It all can make a difference with the productivity. Thank you both. And Nick, how long are you leaving your lays in for before you um, plan a reseed? Well, that's how long is a piece of string? Uh, and the arable, uh, we we've got a bit of an arable rotation, and we will we will put a three or four year one in mainly, uh, mainly Italians and uh, tetraploids. Um, they're just for cutting, um, and uh, on on the more permanent ones, we tend to just. As I said before, leave them until we think that they're not performing or they're coming, becoming gappy. When you know, uh, yeah. and it, it's when you're zero grazing, it you, you can you can it's very it's it's, it's more obvious. It's more it's easier to see than just um, a set stocking system. I think it's the beauty for those that are measuring grass is you can get a real good handle on when your lays stop performing, um, and this spring was a great time for identifying the lays that are struggling. It's the older ones that didn't cope um, with the cold and the wet. Um, you know, yeah. the newer lays did really bounce forward. So yeah, that's the more measurement we can do on farm, the better. Thanks, Chris. And the next question is for you. Do you recommend staying with PRG tetraploids for overseeding or other grasses like fescues or timothy? Again, it depends what I'm overseeding into. So if Nick's going to top up his silage lays, 
then my options are the hybrids, the tetraploids, um, and fesuloms. Nice big seed. I've got plenty of space. Um, mm. But if I've got a long-term grazing lay that I want to top up, then they're probably not the best. It's quite hard because the diploids are a smaller seed. They're a little bit slower to come. They're less aggressive. Um, we just need to be a little bit more careful with TLC if we're going to try and get those. Quite often, I'll I'll put in a standard seed mix that's got a bit of um, tetraploid as well as the diploids um, and try and get a bit of everything in there. Um, and I say it's just about trying to prevent everything out competing those slower to establish grasses. I mean, we've played around over sowing things like Timothy and the like. Um, small seeds just take a long time to, to come through. Thanks, Chris. And Ali, as a grass plant matures, would the sugar content fall? So year two versus 10? Oh, golly, well, we don't continue to, you're talking about a plant that's been established for, for a 10 year period. We don't measure that under the um, recommended list system. They have three harvest years. They will be re-sown again, but it's not the same plant that's lasted 10 years. So generally speaking, um, the plants do reduce in their productivity over over longer periods of time um, and so you, uh, as the plant matures it's more about its maturity throughout the season rather than year on year because you're getting that new growth each year where the, you know that, that you're harvesting rather than old bits of plant that are staying there um, but the, the ability for those growing points to produce new shoots effect effectively and efficiently um, can reduce over time but of course you have the advantage of having a more developed root structure as well yeah if you if you look on the list it give, it gives you um the year when the the, the the particular variety was first introduced and there's some some of the um the older ones that are still there on 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 good recommendations but when you compare them to the the new kids on the block that there is a big difference you know you're talking about four or five percent difference at least on some of them. Yeah. Thank you Nick. And Nick how are you using nitrogen fertilizer? We've got a question here, um, do the varieties perform the same at lower end applications? Right, um, as I say, we, 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 we tend to go around monthly, so we're putting about 40 kilos of nitrogen on every month. Okay. Um, yeah. And we've got, uh, and also we'll chase the, the, the zero grazer around with a, a, a slurry tanker. But it's, it's not slurry, it's mainly dirty. It's dirty water plus is probably the best way of describing it. Um, and that certainly does make a difference if we sort of getting a bit short of water in, in the soil. Yeah, I think there's a there's a lot of um, misunderstanding about the nitrogen regimes, I think, with um, where we sit with plant breeding in that, all right, we, we apply 300 odd K of nitrogen to the trial plots, but in reality, there is no organic nitrogen coming in the system on a breeder's plot. You know, we haven't had a grazing animal there. Organic matter levels yeah. are quite low. Um, and all we're doing is mirroring what Nick would be doing with about 150 Ks plus manure and, and, and turnover like that. So it's, yeah. um, you know, it's a good indication for a lot of people. Um, and we've done trials in the past looking at if we take nitrogen right back. Um, and the ranking of varieties is very, very similar. Um, so they, they function equally as well at, uh, at high and low end regimes. Yeah, and that is an important point in that looking at the data on the list and the varieties there, it's all about the ranking rather than um, you, true data in that sense. So the measures that are given on there are how a variety compares with the mean of that group, not about the variety's own data specifically with how many kilos or tonnes a hectare you can achieve with that particular variety. Um, it, so it is, is relative. And as Chris says, previous studies have been done under low nitrogen conditions and found that those ranks, you know, or it ranked the same. Yeah. Thanks, both. That's a really useful tip. Um, and are the grass mixtures tested for germination like arable crops? How do we know we've got good germination? 
Yes, the uh, seed that comes in, um, new varieties or uh, varieties that are coming from further afield uh, do go for germination testing just to make sure that we have good quality seed going into trial. And then, of course, the, um, the germination is measured by the trial operators as part of their assessment. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, we just have a couple of questions left if any in case any more um sneak in the next few minutes uh, do we have any information on resistance to salt from winter gales not within the data that we use for the recommended list that's not to say there isn't some out there uh, somewhere thank you no. um and again it's this point is your farm is one big experiment um so there's plenty of opportunity you can go and buy a straight variety and do a small piece do a strip with a, a variety. How does it stand up? Does it suit my farm? Um, you know, we need to encourage people to be brave. Go and have a play. Um, you know, I say most seed merchants will will be able to provide you with small amounts of straights of a lot of varieties, and you can do your own trials on farm and find out what suits your system and what really doesn't like the salt. Thanks both. And Ellie, what are the the highlights of the new varieties this year, please? Oh. Now you're testing me. Um, so we've got some good varieties coming through that uh, includes Aberroot, which is an intermediate festololium. Um, that's got excellent D value under simulated grazing and really good high spring growth as well as good ME yield. Um, we've got Weatherby, a late perennial that's got an excellent grazing yield um, under both grazing and conservation. It's also um, got good resistance to crown rust. Um, so we've also got Pinaco and Italian ryegrass, got good yields in both harvest years, excellent second conservation cut yield in the first harvest year and under the monthly cut regime. And so there are, I think we've got nine new varieties that have come to the list this year. And we have a number, a large number more candidates than that. So they, they don't all get through, but those are the ones that have got through. Um, so we'll be collecting more data that will inform the lists as those varieties stay in the system over the next few years. Um, there should be some summaries about the main benefits of each of the new varieties included in the back of the booklet, I believe, that you have for the new RGCL this year. There are other well, ones, obviously, I haven't mentioned. I think one of the biggest changes I've seen sitting on the committee is how much more focused the breeders are on disease resistance, and the scores seem to be really ranking up now. So, yeah, there's a lot of effort gone in as disease issues become more prevalent that the breeders have really responded well. Thank you, Chris. And just on that subject, um, as we think into the future, do we know what's coming up in the future regarding grass breeding and genetics tools? Well, well I, I think, you know, hot, hot topics everybody's aware of is about reducing nutrient inputs Reducing, reducing nitrous oxide emissions, reducing carbon, reducing methane. So um, there's a really broad scale of work across the industry that will, will relate to that. Uh, you know, improved me or reducing methane output basically requires you to have increased efficiency, the conversion efficiency. So there you need your blood sugars um, in your grass to balance with your protein for your microbial activity. Uh, and you want to good, get good efficient conversion of the inputs into the, the grass growth yield. So that means putting your nutrient on at the right time where you possibly can, in the right conditions, um, and just growing the grass as a, as a crop, uh, feeding that plant as, as required to get the best you can out of it. Thanks, Ali. So some exciting things to come. And yeah, Nick, have you... Sorry, things like the festulolums, um, you know, we're very early days in a lot of those hybrids. There's an mm -hmm. awful lot in the system that can come through um, and we'll have more options to do with festulolums for grazing lays as much as silage lays. So that's going to be a huge area of interest. There is a lot more interest as well at present with the last few years we've had um, with grasses that cope better with drier conditions colder springs etc but of course bear in mind that it takes a good 10 12 years plus for the breeders to do their development work for them to get to the stage that they can start coming in the trial system so um and the, the breeders are understandably going to not be widely sharing all their thoughts and development plans um too early on in the process 
Yes, last last spring we we put in a, a, an Italian a plus and Vestolian mix in. It was sown on the 25th of April and it didn't have any rain or moisture for it for probably a month or more. Um, it's been remarkable uh, the the amount of uh, cover that we've got on it. Um, and this spring the field was just waterlogged uh, in patches and it didn't seem to affect it. it we've just taken the sides, cut the sides off it and uh, been really pleased with it. So th th and that, that, that's, that's me just playing with, playing with bits of stuff. There's one thing to bear in mind with festivaliums, the hybrid with fescues and ryegrass is that they can be torn um, fescues or meadow fescues, they can be um, perennial ryegrass, potentially or Italians, and the proportion of the parentage in there is quite variable as well. So until we get more uh, fessalariums coming through the system, it's quite difficult to, to um, categorise them as, as one particular thing, because they, they do have quite a lot of genetic variety there. So speak to merchants, breeders, uh, advisors um, to work out if you do want to go for a fessalarium, just what's the most suitable one, suitable um, a parental stock, if you like, for your system. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, we just got a couple more questions left. Nick, are you using the list to select clover varieties for your farm? Yes, I, I have done in the past. Um, we've got a bit of an issue. We had a, we've had an issue with doc. We, we we're using red clover in the cutting lays, uh, and uh, also for zero grazing, it seemed to work really well. And then we had an issue with doc, so I've sacrificed the clovers at the minute. Uh, we are, I am looking again at them um, for uh, stitching in and I will be using something along the mid, 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 mid table, um, something uh, violin, Dublin, something like that, something that, that's uh, going to give me a, a, a happy medium. Thanks Nick. And is there any extra info, Nick, that you would like to see on the recommended list? Oh, heck. Um, or does it give you everything you need, do you think? <laughs> yeah, I think, I, you know, is, is, is there any room for, I mean, you do protein content in your clovers. Is there any, is there any room for protein content in your, in your, uh, your ryegrasses? Now, well, 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 in previous years, and I'd say not in the recent years, have shown not very significant differences in the okay. protein levels between the different varieties at that point. Um, yeah. And it is something that could be included back in, but the thing to bear in mind is now that the, the recommended list is mostly funded by the breeders, um, every extra assessment oh. that we need to do will add to their, their cost. Um, yeah. and may yeah. encourage them or otherwise to include more varieties in there. But it, it is something, um, uh, as um, Chris will say as well from, from being on the, um, the panels, that it's something that's always is under review. Um, so there are a number of meetings each year and year on year, and as the varieties develop, these things come back around and get discussed again that maybe haven't been talked about for the last couple of years. So um, the the... the people that are on those panels collectively are always thinking about what's the best thing to do with the list for developing it going forward. Okay. Thank you both. And last question for this evening, does the list have a date of when first on the list so you can see how old the variety is, please? Yes, it does. It's surprising how old some of them uh, are on there. There's some from um, 80s and, and beyond, so um, yeah. But if they're on the list still, it's because they're holding their own amongst the other varieties and the new up and coming varieties. It may well be there's particular traits that they're really strong in, and it may be that breeding has changed over um, the years to look at other traits slightly more perhaps, but they do have to hold their own overall in order to remain on the list. Thanks, Ellie, that's brilliant. Thank you, Nick, Chris and Ellie for your time this evening and answering all of those yep. questions. Thank you. 
Thank you. And thanks to everyone at home for listening. Uh, the presentation and questions, questions have been recorded and they'll be available on the Beef and Lamb and Dairy YouTube channels. Um, so thanks again, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evenings and please get in touch if you have any further questions. Thank you. Bye. Bye.